Sheila presents good moral. <laughs> moral already good. <laughs> Now, when you talk about morality, hmm, when you talk about good, good action, bad action, right action, wrong action, so on, what is the criteria? How do we judge whether the action is uh, good or bad, right or wrong? Chetana or volition? What kind of chetana? What kind of volition? Hmm? No, no. I am asking you this question. When you talk about seal and you talk about morality, huh? we talk about good and bad, huh? right and wrong action. But the question is, how are we going to judge? What are the criteria? What are the means by which we can say that this action is right, this action is good, this action is wholesome? What are the means? Hmm? Then after that, uh, you can have uh, an open session where you can ask other questions. So, But first, you need to have a clear understanding of the concept of the concept on seal of morality. Mm -hmm. And uh, just now, I asked you this question. When we talk about morality, we talk about avoiding evil and doing good. This is what morality is all about. But how do we know? What are the ways by which we judge that this action is good, this action is evil? Yes? You have given some of the answers already. The action which which is beneficial to others, but not beneficial to you, also. Ah, yes. The action which is beneficial to oneself and to others. And also, it does not bring harm to oneself, does not bring harm to others. That is what kind of action? Good action, right? Good action. What about the bad action? That it brings harm to oneself, harm to others. Huh? So there is one way by which you can judge it. What are the other ways? Have you not heard sometimes some people say, what is right, what is wrong is just, you know, it is only relative. It is only up to the individual. Haven't you heard this? They say it is in the eyes of the beholder. That means, uh, uh, that means some people, what is right to one person may not be right to another person. Do you agree? <laughs> You agree, you say. Okay. Why do you agree? Hmm? You must know why you agree or disagree. The rest of you disagree. Then why do you disagree? Yes. So? So they take it differently. So what is good to one may not be good to the other. Is that right? It must be based on what Dhamma? <laughs> yes. <laughs> There is something there. There is something there. Of course, Dhamma is there. Yes. But 
water here. Of course, if you are wise, then there's no, there's no problem, no? But here we are talking, we are, uh, first not to consider whether the person is wise or not. If he is wise, he will know already. Huh? But what are the means by which we can uh, judge and we can uh, develop our wisdom from that? No? Wisely, we can wisely judge that action. Now, actually, there are different means, different criteria of judgment, hmm? whether good or bad. Firstly, the one means of judgment is according to each individual. That's why we hear some individuals say, if I think it is right, if I think it is good, that good is good for me. Hmm? No? That is his, according to his individual judgment. Huh? So he accepts certain values the values of right and wrong according to his own judgment, according to his individual point of view. Right? That is one. One way by which the action is uh, the criteria of judgment. Another way Another way, we come to know that action is right or wrong sometimes by considering what others say, what others think, isn't it? Hmm? You know that, have you heard of Confucian ethics? I think Confucianism says that if somebody uh, criticize you for the action and if you hear it from ten mouths uh, ten person then you have to consider it uh, you have to consider again you have to have second thoughts again on your action no? so sometimes we perform certain action we consider certain action to be uh, beneficial or not beneficial according to the public's opinion, according to what others think. That is another way. But is this is a Buddhist way? Is this the Dhamma's way? Not the Dhamma's way. Okay, then what is the dumbest way? What is the proper way in Buddhism for us to consider? Now we have we have rejected this just by an individual's point of view. The individual think that this is right, then huh? it may not be right. On the other hand, other people, what other people talk about? If all other, if those people, uh, they are not so clever, not so wise, uh, and uh, then all others follow that action and accept that kind of judgment, the value judgment. Hmm? So. Sometimes the majority is not right. Hmm? Hmm. So what is a more a more uh, valid judgment? And according to the teachings, according to the Dhamma, let us see. 
very easy. You have heard this thing again and again. Bad thing. Wrong thing. Okay, killing, stealing. Why do person kill? Why do person steal? What is the cause? What is the root cause? Sorry. Ah, now you know. What? Huh? Greed. Hatred. Ignorance. That's right. This is the criteria of judgment. Whether the action is right, whether the action is right or wrong, good or bad, depends upon whether that action is rooted, has its roots in greed, in hatred, or in delusion, in ignorance. Whether the person has performed that action out of greed, out of hatred, or out of confused state of mind, ignorant state of mind. Hmm? If that action has to be has been performed through any one or more of these unwholesome, unskillful roots, greed, hatred and delusion, then we consider that action to be wrong, to be unwholesome. On the other hand, when that action is free from greed, free from hatred, free from ignorance, but it is rooted in opposite of greed. Opposite of greed is what? Generosity, liberality. It is done out of generosity, out of liberality. Or it is done free from hatred, out of loving kindness. Or free from ignorance, but done through wisdom. Then that action we consider as right action, good action, wholesome action. Right? So that this is the criteria of judgment. How we measure an action to be right or wrong, good or bad. Please remember these things because today we live in a society where many people are confused with the sense of values. And uh, in many places that I visit, people seem to, when we talk about morality, they just say that Morality is in the eyes of the beholder. So if you think it is no good, then it is no good. What is good for you may not be good for the other. Huh? Then they ask, even I have heard this question being posed to other religious leaders, and uh, I do not hear a clear-cut answer to this. But in the teachings of the Buddha, you can find a very clear-cut how to judge the action whether it's right or wrong, good or bad. We use other terms. In the Buddhist terminology, Buddhist terms, we use kusala and akusala. Kusala and Akusala. Kusala means wholesome action. Wholesome action means, another term is, skillful action. A skillful action. Mm -hmm. The other one is unwholesome and unskillful action. In what sense is it to be understood as wholesome action? Or skillful? Why do we say that that action is skillful? Because it frees us from 
suffering. It does not lead us to suffering. Huh? It does not give rise to harm. It does not harm us, does not harm another. It is for one's own benefit. For once, it gives more peace, more happiness to oneself and to others. In that sense, it is skillful. In that sense, it is. That is how we, we use all these words. Good. Right, skillful, wholesome, hmm? or bad, wrong, evil, unwholesome, unskillful. In the end, we should measure this action. Whether that action promotes peace, gives rise to more peace, or gives rise to more suffering more harm and suffering. If it gives rise to more harm, more suffering, then we say that action is then wrong, unwholesome. Is that clear? So this is the criteria of judgment. So in the Buddhist criteria of judgment lies basically in this because the teachings of the Buddha, they, it is called Mulawada, Mulawada, that is, it teaches us to look into the root cause, not only this at the surface, but goes to the root, the root cause of action, the root cause of suffering. Hmm? Right. So please remember these roots. How many roots? You have three evil roots and three good roots. Huh? Three evil roots and three evil roots. Let us draw this. Huh? Bad roots. With hatred and ignorance. These three evil roots. When you have three evil roots, what does it give rise to? The roots send the all the bad kind of food huh? to the trunk and then the branches also. That's why it doesn't look very good also, no? <laughs> These branches they are actually three branches only. <laughs> what are these three branches? What does these three branches signify? Huh? Three evil roots give rise to wrong thought, wrong speech, wrong bodily action. What are the wrong bodily actions? Killing, stealing, sexual misconduct. These actions are performed through the body. Involve activities of the body mainly. That is why it is called bodily action. Then, what are the wrong speech? Hmm? All kinds of wrong speech. What are they? Lying or falsehood. Slander. Hmm? Backbiting. Harsh speech. Harsh language. Hmm? And frivolous. Privileged, playful, or we call it useless talk. Hmm? Vain and useless talk. Cursing comes under. When you curse and swear, what is that? 
it comes under harsh speech. Harsh speech. Hmm? Hmm. All right. Uh, <coughs> then, we will go to that one by one. Eh? Uh, try to understand what they are. What are wrong thoughts? These are the three classifications, how we classify wrong thoughts or unwholesome, unskillful thoughts in the mind. Hmm? They are the thoughts of covetousness. What is covetousness? Hmm? Covetousness. Hmm? Covetousness is the desire, the strong desire to possess others' property, others' possession. Hmm? But perhaps in the English language it does not give the exact meaning that uh, of the Buddhist term. The Buddhist term is abhijja visama lobo. Visama is poisonous kind of uh, craving. It's a poisonous kind of craving, dangerous kind of craving, hmm? lower. Hmm? It is uh, this covetousness that people have. They will want to possess others' property through various cunning and crooked and cruel methods. Huh? You know how. Huh? I think uh, this word covetousness, many people commonly uh, refer to husband and wife, right? How? Huh? Thou shall not covet thy neighbor, wife or husband. <laughs> now it must be both, no? Huh? Uh, and uh, don't say only huh? husband only covers wife. Wife also now covers husband, no? So do not, you know how. If you study, don't have to study very much in the books, but if you look around within the family circle, within the relatives, and within some closer friends, you can see how some women hmm, take the husband of others hmm, in very cunning ways. Huh? And how some husband take the wives of others, other wives, in also some very cunning and crooked matter. Hmm? Mm -hmm. ah, covetousness. Covetousness. Huh? Of course, covetousness here should not only be limited to this husband and wife also. Others possessions also, like others houses, others uh, cars. Huh? Sometimes you want to take that person's belonging and you use various kinds of uh, methods, cruel methods, dangerous methods. That is why the, that craving is considered as very dangerous kind of craving, very poisonous kind of craving. Hmm? And that, with that kind of thought, you plan, you plan how to get it. And that thought uh, is considered as unwholesome, wrong thought in the mind. Uh, then, ill will, ill will, anger, ill will, hmm? aversion. They are different degrees. You know what ill will is? Hmm? You have ill will, when you get angry with some people, and you get very angry, first you start with a little dislike, 
and then the dislike become very strong. Eh? When the dislike is not so strong, then uh, you look at that person and you don't want to see for a second time. Or, you know, you just turn away. Then that dislike, that is just a strong dislike, that is just a strong aversion, that's all. But, when this builds up, when the dislike become even still stronger, then the thought arise in the mind that you harbor certain ill will in the mind and you wish that person harm. You wish harm to that person. Huh? You think that person better hmm? lose everything. Huh? He thinks like that. Huh? And drop down. Huh? You have that kind of thought sometimes? Yes. <laughs> there is ill will. So when those thoughts arise in the mind, hmm? then that is a wrong thought because it gives rise to suffering. It gives rise to suffering to yourself. It gives rise to suffering to others also. Because we cannot harm others without harming ourselves. Probably some of you may remember this story, how the little boy in school, hmm, one day when he went to school, uh, on his way, one, his, his classmate hmm, has thrown some stones and some mud at him and his shirt was soiled, dirty. So, this little boy, his friend whose shirt was dirty, he harbored this thought in the mind. He says, watch out next time. Huh? I will revenge. Then he waited, waited, waited for the opportunity. And true enough, after a few days, there was a heavy downpour, rain, and the whole ground was muddy. <laughs> now he thought, this is my chance. <laughs> huh? So he saw that friend of his, that classmate coming. So he said, I will revenge. And quickly, quietly, he take his hand and grab hold hmm, of some mud and cow down there, no? <laughs> Purposely, he grab hold of that and then he aim and throw at him. <laughs> then, then what happened? Then his, that classmate of him, you know, all smeared. Then he laughed and said, hooray, you know, I win. <laughs> But he looked at his hand. <laughs> when he looked at his hand, <laughs> his hand, whose hands? Who got dirty first? Hmm? Ah, the one, the person who wants to harm the other person. He must soil himself, he must dirty himself first. Every time. Every time we wish harm to another person, we first do harm to ourselves first. So, not to harm oneself. Free oneself from this ill will. Free oneself from this ill will. How to overcome ill will? How to overcome ill will? Yes, yeah. loving kindness. Uh. Now, there is another story about ill will. 
This story is very important. You should know this story because last night, Chief Reverend mentioned this name. What is the name? Mention one monk's name. Ah, what? Devadatta. You know Devadatta? You know the story of Devadatta? Hmm? Chulananda? Have you heard Devadatta? Ah, you must learn how Devadatta and the Buddha. Hmm? I tell you this story. Okay? If you know the story, you try to uh, recall and learn this well so that you can tell stories also later on. We will call you up to tell stories. The story on Devadatta. Hmm? There are many stories in the Dhammapada to illustrate about uh, ill will, revenge, but uh, it's a very long story. But Devadatta's story is not so long. Hmm? Devadatta was born during the time of the Buddha. He was born as a cousin to the Buddha. And yet, Devadatta was, had the grudge that he was jealous of the Buddha. When the Buddha gained his enlightenment and he had a lot of followers, then Devadatta could not bear the sign. How is it that the Buddha had so much followers? And one day Devadatta went to the Buddha and asked, you are growing old already. Hmm? Why not? You allow me to lead. You appoint me uh, as the Pope. You know, to lead the others. What did the Buddha say? No, no fear. <laughs> no. Buddha did not want popes in the Sangha. Uh, so, although now some some people have made popes also, you know, Buddhist hunger, you know. And uh, so, Buddha rejected this. When the Buddha rejected, he got very angry. And that is how he tried to kill the Buddha several times, but he could not manage to kill. And in the end, what happened? He realized his wrongdoings. He realized he became very remorseful. He felt very guilty about his actions. And he wanted to ask the Buddha for pardon. So he went and the tradition, the story goes that the earth, the earth opened up and he was swallowed by the earth. Hmm? This story I have heard even when I was young, how my grandmother told me, don't be very naughty and don't be rude uh, to your parents and grandparents. If you are rude and you are not uh, respectful, uh, then the lightning will come uh, and strike you. No? So when we see lightning, we hide. <laughs> so I remember when the, whenever light, whenever thunder, I hear thunder, no? <laughs> I crawl under the altar table <laughs> because I know the lightning will not strike the Buddha. <laughs> so crawl under the table, no? And ooh, sometimes heavy thunderstorm, no? And uh, it works. No? Later on, later on, I, I heard of another story, how this man, no? he was not all that bad, but he was playing golf in the field, and there was a lightning. The lightning struck just at the point where he was standing because he had his golf, golf club there. 
what happened? Lightning struck and hit him. And his, there is one Buddha image here. That Buddha image. No? The gold chain, the gold chain burnt. But the Buddha image did not burn. The Buddha image was there. He was there. No? So, Buddha can save you also. Huh? <laughs> and uh, after that, he had real confidence in the Buddha. After that, he had confidence in the Buddha. Hmm? So, let us come back to Devadatta. This action of Devadatta during the time of the Buddha, Buddha was able to trace back Later on, the Buddha explained to his disciples who Devadatta was. And this is recorded in one of the Jatakas. I can't remember the name of this Jataka. I think some people from Lekha knows the name because they act these things on full moon days. No? Devadatta was in the past in some past lives, he was born into a merchant's family, selling bangles, no? Selling bangles. The Buddha too was born and grew up in a merchant's family, and he too was selling bangles. So both of them were bangle sellers. Only difference was, one was not a very honest one, the other is a honest one. Who was the dishonest one? Ah, 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 they were that the slightly dishonest one. One day, this dishonest Bengal seller went to the village and then to sell his wares, to sell the bangles, and he sees young girl coming. And he puts the bangle into her hands first, no, and says, See, nice, 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 and play it. Now the girl comes to love that bangle, and then he pulled it out again, and he said, No, if you want, you go and tell your grandmother, you want that bangle, and no, I will give you. Then this little girl ran and asked the grandmother, huh? He says, Achi, Achi, I want to buy bangle, no? And uh, uh, grandmother asked her to buy Venga. But the grandmother said, I have no money to buy Venga. Then she looked look around, what do we have in the house? Finally, she found there is one pot, there is one cooking pot, which is made of gold. No? And she says, she loved this little granddaughter so much. So she says, well, this cooking pot, I can give you huh, in exchange for some bangles for my granddaughter. Now this, this honest bangle seller, he took that pot. He, he realized that it was a very heavy pot. And he scratched with the, some bangers, he scratched and he saw, he realized it was gold. But his mind was working. He thinks that if I tell this grandmother that this is gold, she may not part with it. Or she may want very expensive, high price. She may want all the bangers that I have. So I'm not going to give her all this. So he pretended. He knew it was gold, but he was a dishonest person. He took that pot, and, but he was very clever also, you know, a clever and dishonest person. So he took the pot and he threw it down to the ground. And he says, this is a worthless pot. Huh? And uh, I cannot give you any bangers with these things. And then he went away. 
But in his mind, he said, I will see what happens and I will come a little while more. Huh? And a little while more, uh, then she will strike the bargain. We will have the bargain. But while he was away, there came another Bengal seller. Who is that Bengal seller? Not the Buddha, but Bodhisattva. Ah. He was the Bodhisattva. He was perfecting his virtues. And he was an honest Bengal seller, very honest one. Then what happened? He went and he showed the little girl these bangers. The little girl says, quickly ran to the mother, grandmother. Then the grandmother took out the same pot and showed to this honest bangle seller. He looked at it, scratched, and he says, Oh, this is a gold pot, he said. And he says, I cannot take this. Then the grandmother says, why can't you take it? Because, he said, I don't have enough money to give you, for, to pay for you, to pay for this uh, pot. And uh, the grandmother says, what? He says, you say it is so valuable, but the other banker said it is worthless. Huh? Then uh, the grandmother realized. This honest banker seller says, no, it is very valuable. It is gold. Hmm? So he says, then the grandmother pleaded and says, in that case, you please take it. Just give me what you huh, can, the bangers for my granddaughter. So this banker seller gave everything, all the bangers and all the money he had with him and he gave, no? And then he took the gold pot and he went, he walked and crossed the stream, took a ferry, a boat, and crossed the stream, no? Meanwhile, our friend, <laughs> that big honest banker seller, he was, he saw, he was watching, huh? And then he came. He came for the second time. Now he was, actually he did not see, but he was hoping that now he would strike a bargain with the grandmother. When he went to the, the child's, the girl's home, and asked, you know, now do you want these bangles? And the little girl says, see, I have a lot now. <laughs> Huh? And he said, what about the pot you said you wanted to sell me, you wanted to give me? I will give you uh, these few bangers. It is worth these few bangers. The grandmother said, that pot is a golden pot. I have given to that, the other banker seller. What? He said. Now, this, this honest banker seller realized huh, his mistake. But he got very angry. He chased, huh? he tried to chase the honest bangle seller until he reached the river bank. And then he saw that by that time, the honest bangle seller was already in the boat reaching the other shore, the other bank, river bank. So what did he do? The dishonest Bengal seller shouted out and he said, what? What did he say? He was very furious, he said. He said, you, uh, you have, uh, you have defeated me, he said, uh, cheated me, he said. Uh, all this cheater says, you know, others cheat him, you see. Uh, he says, you have cheated me, you have fooled me, he said then. And he gets very angry, he says, I will catch up with you. I will take my revenge, he says. From birth to birth, I will follow you. I will revenge on you. Uh, that was a strong ill will in the mind of that, what you call, Bengal Salah. And because
because of that incident, again and again, from life to life, from life to life, they were born. And they were born together, either as close relatives, friends, in the same family, but fighting always together. Huh? So, we can see these things also happening in our own families, in our own circles of friends. That is why some parents cannot understand why. Why they have children? One child, very good, want to become mom. Children give a lot of torture and unhappiness to the parents. Some children make the parents happy, lead them to the Dhamma. In the same manner, some wives, hmm, some wives come to take revenge on their husband. Some husband come to take revenge on the wife. Hmm? You see, this is why, what is the cause? Because of ill will, hatred, again and again, again and again. Therefore, we should recognize the danger of having ill will in the mind. Hmm? How to overcome ill will? By the practice of metta, loving kindness. Huh? That is how to overcome ill will. So now, ill will is a very dangerous, it's a wrong thought. Hmm? Every time ill will arises in the mind, understand, be aware, it is wrong, it is bad, it leads to harm. It harms oneself, it harms others. Then, the third one, wrong views. Wrong views. What are the wrong views? Hmm? There are different kinds of wrong views, many different kinds. Ten kinds of wrong views, so. Hmm? There are some people who have this view. Even during the time of the Buddha, there are other religious teachers, and they were teaching their followers that there is no such thing as karma. Huh? That uh, we live in this world when we enjoy, we should enjoy ourselves. When we die, nothing more. Some others thought that there is no such thing. Nati Mata, Nati Pita. There is no such thing as mother, no such thing as father. No mother, no father concept. That means there is no such thing of having gratitude or respect to mother, gratitude or respect to father. They also have a philosophy for this because they say that why, how do we come to this world? They did not purposely want us to come, but by accident we came. You know? So, uh, uh, that is why. Uh, that is why they say, so why should we? So they have their own reasons for this. Hmm? And so, very easily, they also get followers. So they have their own reasons for this. Hmm? And so, very easily, they also get followers. Through wrong reasoning. Huh? Then, there are others who said, you can kill. What is, there is no, nothing wrong in killing. After all, what killing is? You know how they define killing? Killing is when you take a sword to cut the head of a person, it is just uh, separating the elements. <laughs> they say, you are just separating the water element, the earth element, and the, the wind and the heat element. You just separate them, that's all. <laughs> and they use philosophy, very scientific ones too. It is true. <laughs> huh? So that is why some people can hold this view. 
And they say that it is no use to have what you call big dana. There is no such, no merits, no, uh, there is no such thing as uh, having a sangika dana, no? And they have their own views about that. Hmm? But these are wrong views, which are those people who have such views. These wrong views condition the thoughts and they prevent them from leading a good way of life, the right way of life. It leads them to more suffering. There are other kinds of wrong views with regards to the self. Hmm? We will talk about that later on. Uh, the self. When there is no real self, nothing permanent in this, we think there is such a thing as self. Uh, things which are changing, we think it is not changing. We think it is permanent. Things which are suffering, we think it is enjoyment, right? Ah. Ah, that is also wrong views, having wrong views. Hmm? There are other kinds of wrong views also. But basically, all these wrong views lead us, conditions the mind to have wrong thoughts and with wrong thoughts, leads us to more suffering, uh, does not lead to liberation. So these are the three kinds of wrong thoughts. Then, wrong speech. I think you may recognize all these words, but the important thing is to understand how it conditions what are the effects that it produces, it conditions? Lying. Why is it bad to lie? Hmm? Why is it bad to lie? Hmm? No. Some people say white lie only. Hmm? But when you lie and somebody finds out that you have lied, then what happens? What's the result? Even if you tell the truth, they will not believe you, right? You know that Aesop's favor, the boy who cried wolf, wolf, huh? You know that one? Ah, the shepherd who cried wolf, wolf, huh? He was watching. He was looking after a herd of sheep. Then, you know, one night he thought he will, uh, he will uh, make, make some fun because, you know, he is very tired and very sleepy and very lonely there. He says, and then he saw there are some people around there. So he shouted, woof, woof, woof. Then, the neighbors, the villagers ran up to the hill, the mountain, to help him. And then he said, oh, you foolish fellows, <laughs> go back, go back, no wolf. And then, then, uh, uh -huh. then the next day, <laughs> the next day, the very next day, real wolves came. He shouted to the top of his head, wolf, wolf, wolf. Nobody came. <laughs> Nobody came. And this time he had it. <laughs> the wolves attacked the sheep and lambs. And then uh, he was fired. No? <laughs> uh, so it, this is the story uh, about lying. And uh, that you will not be trusted. Your word will not be trusted. People will not trust you. That is the consequence. Next, slander. What is this slander? A slander. You know what slander is? Backbiting. What is this backbiting? Huh? 
saying bad things about others. Uh, you know, it is more than that, just saying bad things. There is an intention, there's a bad intention also. You say certain things, sometimes true also, no? Sometimes it is bad but true. Huh? Sometimes bad but not true. <laughs> so, you can take some bad things about the other person when you get angry. When you are friends with one another, oh, you talk very well of that person. All his bad habits, you overlook it. But one day, you want to borrow the car, your friend's car. And this friend says no. Then you get angry with that friend. Then you go and tell all your other friends. You know? You know her? Uh, you know whom she goes out with? Uh, last night I saw like that. The, uh, the other last week I saw like that. Huh? It may be true. But he picks up this kind of things. Bad things to bring up, to tell the other friends. And so that, why? In order to separate, since he thinks that, oh, you do not want to give me, okay, watch out, you are so popular, I make you very uh, unpopular. Uh, and you know, now some people have this as their profession, slandering as their profession, you know? Mm. <laughs> in the pub, <laughs> how, uh, when they take that person because they have, they are very popular, uh, then they bring out all the bad things to tell the other people. Hmm? Uh, and then people hear that, oh, he is so bad. Then they run away and join the other uh, person. In other words, here, you speak bad to separate one from the other. How many families have been separated by this method of slander? Hmm? They separate families by slandering, by backbiting. They separate brothers from sisters, brothers and brothers, sisters and sisters. True the tongue through this word of mouth. Huh? Monks also, they separate those monks. Teachers and pupils, they can separate. Huh? Because of what? Because some lay people, because they cannot get certain things from the chief monk, then they go and tell, you know, chief monk like this, like this, like this, like this. Huh? And then the poor pupil, innocent, believe these things and then separate, run away. How they leave separation. When one performs this kind of action, what happened as a result? That is why you see, sometimes, you are not aware of it. Sometimes you don't understand why suddenly you are separated. Uh, people, they come, meet with a friend, and then they are separated. For no cause, no rhyme or reason, it seems. Not that there is no cause. Maybe you cannot see the, the cause in this life. The cause lies in, in the past, in the past actions. Huh? How parents today are separated from their children. Husbands are separated from their wives. And not only that, sometimes they marry again, again they are separated. Again. Not, there may be, all the other things may be favorable, but somehow or other, uh, they are separated in this way. There is this cause. Uh, this is one of the causes that leads to this kind of separation. The other, Harsh speech. You know what harsh speech is about? No need to teach you. 
<laughs> All the root words. Huh? The root words. No need to learn. No need to go to school to learn these words. You pick up these words very quickly. Huh? But, but strangely, I find that when I was in school, I don't hear so many root words as when I go to the university. Yes. In the universities, in the colleges, among those people, I find, I hear more, huh? more of such words. Like water, it flows, you know, from their mouths. I was shocked. It was a cultural shock, really, once, when some woman uh, and uh, this classmate suddenly let out, fly out certain words, you know. I thought women never talk like that, you know. <laughs> I thought only they, when they are among themselves, they will talk like that. But this one, they have no restraint. They use because they think when they go to the colleges they think you know we are we must be rugged in order to be rugged we must speak like that no if we don't use these words people may think we are sissy people may think that we are we are you know oh very yeah uh, yes they think that we are very weak and we are we are not strong. We are not rugged, they use. We must be rugged. These are what you call intellectual barbarians. We call them intellectual barbarians. Huh? They are very clever, but rough spoken, not refined. Now, how do you like while you are sleeping upstairs? Then suddenly somebody come and, you know, they talk some very harsh words. They are not scolding you, but they are scolding somebody else. How do you feel? You like to listen to that? Ah, you don't like to listen to it. So in a similar manner, when you talk those kind of words, you think others like? But you can mix only a certain company. Birds of a feather flock together, they say. Uh, some like to listen, yes, that's right. <laughs> some will like to listen there. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, then, do you know, every morning, if you wait, if you just stand and walk by some of the, what do you call, flats, morning, you can hear harsh words. The mother scold the children, all kinds of words. Uh, it is no wonder, after one or two years, this little child, you know, use the same word again to the mother and to the father. Because, uh, because they learn, they learn from that environment. So the restraint in harsh speech. Speak politely, learn how to speak, uh, pleasant, politely. Mm. Otherwise, people have to spend a lot of money. The government too have to spend so much money. For what? Courtesy campaign. <laughs> if only they promote Buddhism like this. Ah, and people l learn the value of refined huh, speech. No need to spend so much of taxpayers' money. Mm -hmm. Then, frivolous talk. Mm -hmm. What is this frivolous talk? Eh? Chit chat, chit chat, chit chat, talk nonsense. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, after you talk nonsense, you go. Uh, I think some of you may remember the times when you go and stand in one corner of the road uh, and uh, sit down somewhere and then wait for another friend and then talk yik yak 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 and then after that huh, you ask what is that? Uh, what have we talked about? 
<laughs> you don't know what you are talking about. Or you go to party. Remember, you go to party. But what do you talk in a party? To make friends. So we have to talk about what? You say, oh, very nice dress you have, huh? Oh, I recognize that jeans. <laughs> huh? And then you talk about the brand. Then after that, you move, oh, your hairdo, style, huh? Ah. Where? <laughs> when you go next time, they say, oh, you have got really good hairstyle, huh? <laughs> you see? Then after that, they talk about the hair. From the hair, they move on. Huh? They move on to dress. After that, they look at the shoes and say, oh, where do you get these shoes, huh? <laughs> I never seen these shoes before. So they talk about the hair, the dress, the shoes. And that's how they spend the whole evening, whole night. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, handbag also. <laughs> yes. Handbag. Everything. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> these are these are topics for talks anyway. No? And uh, sometimes we also start like that. But we must know how to turn that useless talk into useful talk. You know, some people write books about history, about wars and all that. Huh? These are also considered as useless kind of thing. No? Because it does not lead one to realize the true nature of oneself does not help one to discipline oneself. No? But after writing those works, after speaking all the nonsense, hmm, then he points out, uh, you know, everything is subject to change. Your fashion, the dresses, subject to change. Your hair, Huh? You, you curl like this, you curl like that, huh? but it does not stay very long, isn't it? How long does it stay? Huh? It falls down like that. Why? Because it is changing. That is anicca. Ah. Now you turn the subject of discussion to anicca. So you must know how to skillfully turn from that useless stuff to useful stuff. Huh? You look at the handbag, you say, huh? What? What can you talk about the handbag? Uh, see, how? You cannot keep that all the time, no? Whatever is in your bag, that is not really yours, no? Uh, you know, and how to explain that it is not really yours. He says, how come it's not really mine? Huh? Because, can you take that with you? Huh? He says, of course, I'm taking that with me all the time. Ah, then you bring up and you can see uh, this is how you skillfully turn the talk to useful talk. And then you will make them realize the nature of the lie. And then when they realize the nature of the lie, they realize that then when you have useful talk, talking about the true nature of life, then these thoughts will motivate the mind to have right thoughts, to motivate the mind will to practice, to overcome suffering, to discipline one's speech, to discipline one's thoughts and action. But when you talk all those things, huh, you make only enemies. You go back, you think, where can I get that handbag? Where can I do that hairdo? Which one? How much it is? So it only adds on to more and more craving. Right? So now you know what frivolous stuff is. Huh? But here, here, even if they tease you, even they tease you, then you must say it, that this gives me an opportunity to practice patience. Tolerance. Mm? Ah, then, but the other person, uh, you must 
also not encourage the person to uh, uh, to tease too much without otherwise uh, become enemy we have aversion for one another these are the four kinds of wrong speech mm? then the three kinds of wrong actions that one no need to explain to you already you have touched on what zila is so these things wrong thoughts wrong speech wrong bodily actions very important to understand to understand what they lead to this is called the akusala actions the 10 unwholesome actions 10 unwholesome actions akusala kamma hmm? oh i see yes very good huh? in malay it is akusala <laughs> <laughs> Aku means I, <laughs> Salah means wrong, <laughs> so I am wrong. <laughs> so Aku Salah means, <laughs> that's right, <laughs> very good. <laughs> so we learn something <laughs> now. <laughs> very good, Aku Salah. <laughs> uh -huh. What about Ku Salah? <laughs> ku Salah means Ku, you. <laughs> huh? <laughs> ku Salah. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Then uh, now you have any questions about these issues? Hmm? Now you know what sila is, right? Why do you practice sila? What is the purpose? What is the purpose of uh, restraining our speech and action? Why do we want to restrain? Yes. Why? Why don't why why you want to ex abstain from bad things? <laughs> why do you want to call it loving kindness for? Oh, good, 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 good. Then uh, through. Let us see. Let us hear from the others. Yes. Benefit others. Benefit oneself. Mm. Yes, but uh, but the question is this: Why do we want? Why do? We, why should we be virtuous? Why should we avoid these harsh speech and uh, all the wrong speech and wrong actions? Yes. How does one cease from suffering through these actions? Before one purifies the mind, what happens? All right, your it is right. What happens is this: see the cause and effect, how conditions, how an action conditions, body action condition the mind, how mind condition body action. Now you observe when you, if you have killed somebody, if you have stolen something. Uh, from the library, library book. <laughs> if you have stolen and put your name, and when Chief Reverend goes around, walk around, how do you feel? You feel pop, 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 pop. <laughs> your mind is restless. If instead of hearing the Dhamma, you start drawing, 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 drawing. <laughs> And when I come near you, uh -huh, then you feel what? Uh, you quickly want to hide the book. Uh -huh. Then you have, you feel guilty. Your mind is restless. There is remorse in the mind. That is what you call remorse uh, in the mind. When you have done your work, if you do your work, you don't lie and you don't steal then your mind is free from that free from remorse free from the guilty actions when your mind is free from guilty actions naturally your mind is calm composed then naturally with a composed mind 
with the calm, happy mind, peaceful mind, that is conducive to concentration. So this is how sila is the foundation to samadhi, to concentration, to mental discipline, right? So it has a direct, direct value to our lives. Why can't the school children concentrate in their schoolwork? Hmm? When, not only playful, when they cheat by copying their homework, huh? or uh, due to these wrong actions, uh, lying, uh, stealing, uh, uh, then when they try to concentrate their minds, when they have ill will, angry, every time get angry, breakfast, not enough, breakfast, no taste, uh, and every day the same thing. You go to school with an angry mind and think, why, you know, like that? Can you study? Cannot study. Burn, you get headache, stomach ache. That is. Huh? But when you have contentment, uh, when you know, pati sangka, yoni so, pata, only for the purpose of maintaining my health. Then no complaint, your mind is contented. No aversion. Then you go to school, you can study. Uh, when you are angry, cannot concentrate. Right? So when you have right thoughts, right speech, right action, it frees your mind from remorse, frees your mind from guilty conscience, and that paves the way for you to discipline your mind. Right? That is the function of morality. It helps to compose oneself, compose oneself. So you know the function. Now. You know what? Why? Huh? Now you ask about how to practice sila. How to practice sila. Hmm? Now, still, I think uh, uh, Chief Reverend still talking on sila, no? Your precepts and uh, how you should observe the sila. With mindfulness, the main thing in order to practice sila, there must be mindfulness and awareness. Now you observe how many precepts, ten precepts, right? Now there are some people, some very old people who are lying in bed, they are sick. They cannot kill. They cannot raise their hand to kill. Right? They cannot lie because they cannot talk. Hmm? <laughs> huh? They cannot have sexual misconduct also. <laughs> huh? And they cannot steal because nobody around them. <laughs> yeah. huh? Then uh, they cannot take drugs also. Uh, what you call, huh? Ganja also they cannot take, they cannot drink. Huh? Are they observing five precepts? But they are abstaining from all that. Uh, no, they are not observing the precepts. To observe the precepts, all the conditions are there and you stop. Yeah. You see there is a lot of what you call mangoes on your way to school, on your way to office, or your neighbors, huh? a lot of mangoes. Eh? All the conditions are there. You get up early in the morning. Hmm? Nobody is looking. You have a very big bag. <laughs> Half of it is empty. <laughs> so it is just, you know, you just pluck and put in. After all, only one only. <laughs> ah, that is. Then, as soon as you want to do that, the sound comes. Adinna, dana, veramani, sikha, pranasamadhyami. Then immediately you remember, then the emergency break comes. Whoop! <laughs> Come back, this thing. <laughs> you see? So you see how this, that is why you always take the precepts. 
or at least you remind yourself to impress in your mind so that when you want to do the action, the moment you want to do the action, then this mind, because you have taken it and you have mindfulness, you have awareness, then. But if you have no mindfulness, no awareness, you say, Panadi Pata Veramani Sikha Vedan and you start, huh? You start killing all the mosquitoes and ants around you and you say, Panadi Pata Veramani Sikha Vedan Samadhiya. This is, this is not observing precepts. They are just reciting the precepts for them. Recital is one thing, observance is another. So please learn to the difference of this. See uh, how to observe that. Uh, there is the chetana, chetana, uh, sila, chetana. The restraint, restraint in speech, restraint in actions. Now, a last bit is about sila is what is the advantage? What is the benefit? Because people go around and say that if we want to become rich, if we want to become wealthy, we should not be too virtuous. If we are virtuous, if we are honest, how can we become rich? Right or wrong? We must ask the businessman. <laughs> if you are not businessman, you may say, <laughs> you may agree with the Dhamma. But when you do business, do you think it is so? Right. Many people have this view that unless they cheat a little bit at least, they cannot get rich. But what did the Buddha say? The Buddha says there are five advantages of practicing morality. What are these five advantages? Firstly, he said, the first result is there is large fortune, large fortune, wealth. The person who is honest, kind, generous, virtuous, as a result of this thing, he will be born in a fortunate family with fortune. It is those who do not have that fortune and they try to get rich by hook or by crook and by crook, huh? uh, then they get the money but they have no peace. Then the other one, the second one is, hmm, they get good reputation when you behave yourself well. Huh? Oh, the reputation goes out. Boy, the novices this year very well disciplined, no? Look, when they eat, they are very disciplined and huh, they sit very mindfully and huh, uh, they will bring bonus ice cream for you. you know? When the news spread like this, but when the news spread that, look at the way how they walk, look at the way how they eat, huh? then bad reputation. <laughs> so when you do good, when you have sila, respect others, then your reputation goes abroad. No need to put in the newspaper, but the word of mouth has spread. Good. Huh? And you get good reputation. And that is why, if you are a businessman has good will, is honest, his good will, his reputation spread. He does not have to spend so much money on commercials. Huh? So he can keep his costs huh? low, running costs low. See, the value of Dhamma. Next one, when you observe Sila, then you become fearless. Fearless in the sense that you are not afraid to face various assemblies. Whether it is to face your parents or face your teachers or face the public, face the policemen, you are not afraid because you have not done wrong. You have not done wrong.
But if you have done anything wrong, who, huh? Just like the dog, huh? With the tail underneath. The fear, the fear. <laughs> yes, that's right. So, this, this is the result. You can see how little ones, when they lie, huh? and then you ask them, do you lie? If they have learned to lie, then they say, no, 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 I did not do these things, no. And you look at their hands, and you look at their feet, they start to shake. Huh? Uh, because, uh, uh, then, that's right. You see how uh, the, the, the fear is there. That is, what, that is how they have invented the lie detector, you see. It is through this, uh, because how the action gives rise to reaction. And this is the Dhamma. The Buddha realized these things. This is the nature. This, that's why we call the Dhamma. Natural law. Others can, others can pardon you, but that natural law won't pardon you. No? That, that is the karma, the karmic flow. Then, the fourth one. Fourth and fifth one, you may not be so interested because the fourth one says, in the time of death, then the mind is peaceful. There is no confusion in the mind. Because if you have done wrong things, uh, if you have done, you talk bad about monks, huh? then when you get sick, you call the monks to go to you, and you see another monk, ooh, you know, you remind all the bad things that you have done. Then you get fearful thoughts. Not like what Chief Reverend said last night, you know, that man who has a son, but if you have done something bad, then this, in the last moment, whatever you see, your mind associates with certain bad things that you have done, and then the mind becomes confused. Therefore, do good, avoid evil, do good to have this free, unconfused mind. When you die with unconfused mind, then rebirth takes place in a good realm. So, the next advantage is good births, good rebirth. These are the five advantages. There are more than this, but this is only on a certain discourse, in a certain instance, the Buddha mentioned these five. But on another place, the Buddha has mentioned other advantages and benefits of sila. Now, I think uh, I shall have to stop here. And uh, now you know all this, what sila is, the course, the, the purpose, and uh, how you should practice sila, how you should observe sila, and also then the advantages of sila. Please try to remember these things so that uh, you will be able to convince others, uh, uh, reason out to them, and that is how you can bring others to the Dhamma. Hmm? Don't say, why is it good? Because it is not bad. Huh? That is not enough. Huh? That's why you have come here to study the causes, to study the conditions. Uh, cause, 